And if you guys are, if, if you are Kirby readers, you are Salt Lake Tribune readers, you are among our most loyal readers, and I just want to say thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Before we get started tonight, I want to just uh, say thank you to two people. Uh, one is the person who's going to host tonight with Robert, and her name is Jennifer Napier Pierce. And she's the one who pulled the strings together to make this happen tonight. And I would just like to say thank you to Jennifer. Uh, she did a great job. And then I'd also like to thank managing editor Sheila McCann. Sheila's job is to keep Kirby in line. That's a hard job. OK. Now, uh, before we get started, um, I'd like to talk about a guy who, uh, depending on your point of view, uh, should be thanked or blamed for Robert Kirby being in the Salt Lake Tribune. His name is, is James E. Shelley, and he's the former editor of the Tribune. He goes by Jay, and sometimes certain people in Utah would call him the great Satan. <laughs> Jay has uh, gone on, left the Tribune about 10 years ago, and now teaches journalism in Louisiana, but he is still a big fan of Robert Kirby. And when he read Kirby's column that Kirby was going to do this tonight, he got on the phone, called me, and said, hey, can I give you a few words to read that night? Well, it was Jay, so I know it wouldn't be a few words. Uh, so here's what Jay wanted me to read, and it's kind of a letter to Kirby. Brother Kirby would have you believe he was called and ordered to begin writing columns for the Tribune on a 48-hour hour notice. Don't kid yourselves. He would have paid the Tribune a weekly fee to get out of writing for the Utah County Journal and being a Utah County cop on the side. <laughs> the fact that he was offered the princely sum of $30 per column had a lot to do with him jumping ship. That was 20% more than he received from writing Village of Springville speeding tickets, whatever speeding means in Springville. That the Tribune had a Mormon humor columnist ought to have been controversial enough. But the ink was barely dry on Kirby's first column when he challenged LDS President Gordon B. Hinckley to a fist fight. <laughs> he got past that crisis a month later by brilliantly proposing the LDS church name its, its new unified campus a little bit of Paris. The only person who was in deeper hot water than the Tribune editor over Kirby's columns was Kirby's bishop. But Robert Kirby's columns and books work and are read. They work so well because of an unusual assortment of talent he possesses. To name but a few of these obvious attributes, he has, he has the sensitivity of Oren Porter Rockwell. He has the brevity of Gordon Monson. He has the delivery of a Rod Decker. S sorry, Kirby. Uh, I was going to cut that one, but I thought Jay would really get mad at me. The candor of a John Swallow. S sorry about that one, too, Kirby. Uh, the memory of a Mia Love. <laughs> I didn't write this. Uh, the guaranteed delivery of a Ute football player two steps from the end zone. <laughs> the communication skills of a Ron McBride. 
and the sense of humor of a Boyd K. Packer. <laughs> These ingredients combine to, to make Brother Kirby a success. With such talents, however, success is a given. I am happy to report that we finally raised his pay to $40 a column. Robert Kirby took his columns to the loftiest king kingdom in a non-celestial world, a legendary league of its own in this still marvelous profession of ours. And I, as well as others here tonight, stand in awe of a genuine Utah legend. Congratulations on this special night, Brother Kirby. We appreciate you. <laughs> now, you all are testament to the loyalty of Kirby's readership. And I would just like to give you one more testimonial to that loyalty. As readers of Kirby know, Kirby one time had his pocket knife confiscated by TSA agents at the airport and uh, wrote about it. Well, Ron Beck, is Ron Beck here tonight? Anyway, Ron Beck, a, a, a reader from Sandy. Oh, there he is. Hey, stand up. Uh, OK, OK. And hey, Ron, if I get this wrong, sorry. Uh, but anyway, Ron Beck uh, read that column, and he went, I think, to a TSA auction where they auctioned off the stuff they had confiscated, and Ron uh, bid on, and, and apparently won, uh, every pocket knife that was confiscated, <laughs> or, or at least some of the pocket knives that were confiscated. And he mailed this, this, this envelope came to the Tribune newsroom, and it says, Mr. Robert Kirby and it's a uh, envelope full of pocket knives, and the idea being that perhaps Kirby's pocket knife <laughs> is in this envelope. I, I, well, how, how about we let Kirby open it? And <laughs> <laughs> and, with, and with that, here, here are Jennifer and uh, Jennifer Napier Pierce and the, the, the man of the hour, Robert Kirby. Have a seat, get comfortable. <laughs> I guess I'm gonna need this. Okay. Did you ever think that you'd be doing this for 20 years? Uh, no, I actually didn't think I'd last a couple years. Why not? Well, because it's not the, not the state where you say rude things about Mormons, unless, <laughs> unless you are one. <laughs> well, we're going to get to Mormons a bit later. I need to start with your fascination with incendiary devices. And in particular, cannons. Where does this, this fixation come from? Ask the men in the audience. <laughs> I mean, we're born with it, right? Yeah, see? <laughs> Only a woman would ask that question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> a bowling ball, nice. You solicited bowling balls in one of your columns. Yeah, I ended up with about a um, hundred of them. It was pretty cool, too. They all have names like Bucky and, you know, Missy and Sarah and John. Okay. We need to watch a little clip of Kirby playing with his toys, and then we'll talk about it. Oh, cool. You might want to rewind that, Sheena. That was 
Holds up perfectly good clothes dryer. That's my friend Sonny. Now you wow. see, why do you have to ask That's what's the fascination? Yeah, that would hurt. That's wow. <laughs> Butch is excited. Okay, what went through Perfect. that was a soft drink can loaded with concrete. <laughs> this is a bowling ball. We missed the first shot. It's somewhere in Colorado. that slow motion. I love how it's just torn apart. Um, so shooting cannons off in the wilderness got you into a little a bit of trouble this year with the BLM. Perhaps you can share your interactions with the government. Um, somebody wrote a letter to the editor that was really upset with that bowling balls wandering around <laughs> over there somewhere. <laughs> somebody better Thank you. <laughs> oh, you should keep it. I'll hurt somebody. Um, we would go out to Rush Valley and shoot the cannons there because you can see farther than you can shoot, so you know that nobody's out there. And uh, sometimes you don't always find all the bowling balls, and sometimes you find more than you went with. Um, be, it says that other people are doing it too, but. A uh, reader wrote a letter to the editor and said that he was pretty upset about that um, because we'd shot at some cows. Um, the cows were actually a couple of miles away and we didn't even come close, but they ran away. And uh, so the BLM contacted me and wanted to make sure that everything was on the up and up. And it was. Uh, we made nice with them. And uh, then the next time we got into trouble was when we were shooting it out on the salt flats and... Uh, BLM rangers came out there and said we needed a permit to do it. And uh, so having been stopped the second time, we took the bowling ball that came back down and broke it in half and inscribed it to the head of the BLM in Utah and sent it to her. What'd she think? Never heard back. <laughs> in my job, that's a good thing. Tell us about your cannon. Where do you get a cannon? They make them. We got, um, I can't remember how many now, I think 13. And uh, we can shoot everything from uh, 50 caliber bullets all the way up to bowling balls. Billiard balls, tennis balls, golf balls. You look for stuff like that uh, because then you have a ready-made ammunition supply. But the ammunition of choice is the, the bowling ball? Oh yeah, it's really, we can shoot one 900 yards which is a lot farther than I can think. <laughs> Let's talk about your early childhood. My what? You that grew up in totally this military cool. family. You moved quite a bit, which you talk about. And maybe you can describe your upbringing, because when I see these two pictures juxtaposed, I'm just trying to figure out how you got from here to there. It's kind of scary, isn't it? It is, actually. Um, a lot of really bad decisions. <laughs> but the fact that I actually got to this age um, <laughs> was a result of one of the best decisions I ever made, which was to marry my wife. Um, I, by all rights, I should be dead by now. But she gave me that eye. about your childhood? Um, <clears throat> my father, who's sitting right over there, um, was in the military. And we moved quite a bit. Uh, and I think that actually helped me develop a sense of humor in that <clears throat> when you're the new kid and you have 
social interaction problems. <laughs> when you're the new kid every year at school, you tend to develop defense mechanisms that help you get through that. And I think we tallied it up one day, and by the time I was 21 and um, married, I'd lived in 19 homes. Were you the class clown? Um, it depends on who you ask. I guess I was the class demon to a lot of teachers. But you never expect it out of a face like that. <laughs> but every bad thing I ever did, you can read right there. <laughs> you, uh, you grew up in a Mormon family. Yes. And you decided to serve a mission. And I, I'm sure you were a model missionary, right? Merch. Except for maybe this dog. Maybe you can tell us about the canine connection on the mission. I had a dog on my mission. We weren't supposed to have dogs or pets, but I had this dog. And uh, He looks great in the getup. <laughs> and we would take him tracting like that. <laughs> and you go up and knock on the door, and they're not used to stuff like this down in South America. And nobody or North ever America, for that matter. Yeah, nobody ever slammed the door when we showed up with a dog like that. And as long as you didn't try to explain what the dog was doing, they'd just stand there. And uh, we did it for about a week. And eventually had to stop doing it because my companions started running out of white shirts. <clears throat> There's a reason why dogs don't wear them. Um, but the assistants to the president found out that I was doing this and they came out to the uh, apartment where we were living and told us, you know, it says in the handbook you're not supposed to have pets um, and uh, this has given people the wrong idea about the church so you have to get rid of this dog. And uh, I said, or what? And turns out they didn't have an or what that was good enough. <laughs> so I kept the dog and we stopped doing that though. Were you happy that you went on a mission? Yeah. How did, how did it sort of shape the rest um, of your life? Well, it got me off the track that I'd been on before I went on a mission. And um, it was sort of like a two year Alcoholics Anonymous for me. <clears throat> and uh, it was also, you know, some of the toughest things I've, one of the toughest things I've ever done because to be surrounded by people that you're not entirely like and to be forced into that kind of a regimen uh, is a lot more difficult for some people than it is for others. It was very difficult for me until they sent me to this place where it was just me and one other elder and I was the boss. <laughs> Worked out great then. So you came home from your mission and life continued. You became a cop. How did that happen? My wife was tired of me being unemployed as a carpenter. <laughs> so she was going through the want ads and she found this uh, one ad for police officers out in Tooele County, a little town named Grantsville. And, uh... Some fans of Grantsville. From uh, Grantsville, oh really? <laughs> I, I tell everybody this, that, and because my brother's the police chief in Tooele, uh, that Tooele County's where God practiced making people before he got really good at it. <laughs> I know that stings a little bit, but it's, it's still true. Um, yeah, and so she, she said, go out and apply. You know, you'd been an MP in the Army, so maybe they'll be stupid enough to hire you. And it turns out they were. And so my trans, this was back before the, the agencies actually had to send you to the police academy before they turned you loose on the public that they could wait up to 18 months to see if they wanted to keep you before they invested in the money for that. And so I, I went from being an, 
uh, out of work carpenter to a police officer literally overnight. But that didn't <clears throat> take. You decided to be a writer. Why did you start writing? You were you were still a cop at the time. Yeah, I was still a cop at the time. Um, yeah, These that's are true. your words, by the way. Um, being a police officer was okay. I mean, I, I'm proud that I did that, but it wasn't really for me. Uh, it was just another regimen that I wasn't suited for. And I hit on the idea of writing because, again, of my wife, uh, who insisted that I put some of this down and take it to a local newspaper editor, and they liked it enough to write it. And uh, I took a night class at BYU, and uh, I wrote an essay about a suicide I'd gone to as a police officer. And in the class, there were, it was like me and 30 12-year-old kids. <laughs> and by the time the teacher got done reading this essay that I'd written, you could hear people crying in uh, the classroom. And I thought, cool. I want to do that a lot. We heard earlier from uh, former Salt Lake Tribune editor Jay Shelley. He brought you to the Tribune. What was that transition like? What was, is there common ground between being a cop and a columnist? Um, yeah, there is. I mean, you're typically writing people up. <laughs> <clears throat> and when I was a cop, I'd have to stop them one at a time. Uh, but I mean, a newspaper columnist, you can do it to the whole state. Do you think about your audience when you're writing? Um, what their reaction's gonna be? I actually think about the people that I'm gonna make mad. <clears throat> That's um, an inspiration? Oh, you bet. <laughs> um, I, never, I, mean, I tell people that writer's block for me only lasts until I go to church. And it doesn't have to be mine. <laughs> There's just something about an or, you know, a place where people have a lofty set of ideals that they're trying to live up to and not doing nearly as good a job as they think they are. <laughs> and uh, there's irony in there. And, and most of what I, I like about writing is irony. Hmm. That segues perfectly into our next slide. You draw heavily on LDS culture. Yeah. I drove this that up great. to the church office building. <laughs> Tell us about the Wienermobile juxtaposed oh, by they bring, the church They bring this building. Oscar Mayer Wienermobile on tour around the United States, and I guess it's a promo thing, but when they sent the information about it, the press release to the Tribune, I said, that's my story. <laughs> <clears throat> and I had a, several places that I wanted to take it to, and... Uh, one of which was the state capitol, but it turns out that the troopers up there already didn't like me. <laughs> and I had to leave. But there were no police here. And so we took it up and took pictures. And people were across the street taking pictures of this. I love that photo. It's, it's yeah, classic. It's, yeah, it is. I, uh, I want you to actually read from one of your columns, if you would. This is, um, this is something you wrote in October 1994. You dropped it. It is titled, Five Kinds of Mormons. Do you want to set this up a little bit? Um, yeah. I had been working at the newspaper uh, after I left police work, uh, the Utah County Journal, and it was a little free shopper. What? <laughs> and uh, the editor approached me one day and said, we need you to write an editorial because the one we had ready for the paper tomorrow has fallen through. And uh, he asked me if I could do that in a really fast, expeditious manner. And I said, yeah, I can do that. And I had no idea what a house editorial was. That it was supposed to be the newspaper's official position on a given subject. <laughs> I was still just a cop who knew how to spell. And um, so I sat down and I pounded this thing out called uh, Five Kinds of Mormons. 
And it was my theory at the time that of all the Mormons there are in the world, there are only five basic types. And uh, there were liberal Mormons, and there's not a lot of those, but more than you might think. Um, there are genuine Mormons, and there's like six of them. <laughs> and conservative Mormons, Orthodox Mormons, and Nazi Mormons. And uh, I turned it in, went home, and the editor called me about 10 o'clock that night and said, what the hell's the matter with you? <laughs> and I asked him why, and he said, well, this isn't very nice. And I told him, well, you better not run it then. But he did, and it was in the paper the next day with a picture of me next to it. <laughs> so this um, actually became the first column in the first book that Pat and I Pat Bagley and I did together. You want me to read this? If you would. It's a classic. Okay, now look, don't throw anything at me, okay? Um, I, don't, I don't see as well as I used to. Keep the bowling balls to yourself for the time being. All right, in the entire world, there are only five kinds of Mormons. Liberal Mormons. This includes all Mormons who attend church only when they feel like it. Liberal Mormons vote anywhere to the left of the Republican Party, are not rabidly pro-life, and don't believe every word that falls from the lips of a general authority represents the actual personal opinion of Jesus Christ. Liberal Mormons are going to hell. <laughs> Just ask any of the other four kinds of Mormons. <laughs> On the other hand, liberal Mormons think the intolerance and naivete of other Mormons is more of a threat to mankind than Russian missiles, wheat weevils, or R-rated movies. Uh, genuine Mormons. Nearly every Mormon thinks this is the kind of Mormon he or she represents. In reality, general, genuine Mormons are about as rare as, oh, say, angels or gold plates. True, general, true genuine Mormons are unimpressed with themselves and their own opinions. They are affable, easygoing, and keenly interested in the well-being of others. They live various lifestyles, have a variety of friends, and when compared to the more outlandish lifestyles of other Mormons, tend to be dang near invisible. A friend of mine says this is because all, general Mormon, all genuine Mormons, I got that word stuck in my head, because all genuine Mormons have been translated, not even. Studies have proven that there are only 11 genuine Mormons on the face of the earth. Two of them live in Utah, three in the remainder of the United States, two in South America, one each in Japan, Canada, Samoa, and Spain. There are no genuine Mormons in California or Idaho. There was a 12th genuine Mormon in England, but she died. Conservative Mormon. These kinds of Mormons are the suit and flowered dress crowd you see at church. They tend to be overweight and Republican. They attend church 95% of the time, but may, if pressed hard enough, sleep through general conference. They pay tithing on 10% of their net income and have 4.5 children. The homes of conservative Mormons are decorated with Relief Society produced knickknacks. Conservative Mormons humor liberal Mormons because God says they have to. 75% of the LDS church is conservative Mormon, and 99% of all conservative Mormons were born into the church. Orthodox Mormons. This kind of Mormon would not miss church for the death of a relative. Left to their own devices, Orthodox Mormons would eventually make the bringing of dry cereal and Tupperware bowls to sacrament meeting a gospel ordinance. <laughs> Orthodox Mormon women stop having children at 36 because 35 are too many even for them. That was the part where I thought I'd get hit in the head with something. <laughs> Orthodox, Mor Orthodox Mormons are scared of Russians, MTV, and accidentally partaking of the sacrament with their left hands. <laughs> they believe liberal Mormons are children of the devil. Orthodox Mormons pay tithing based on their gross income and believe that Diet Coke is part of the word of wisdom. 
Nazi Mormons. 10% of the LDS church is Nazi Mormon. Of that 10%, 90% live in Utah, most within potlucking distance of BYU. <laughs> Nazi Mormons claim Diet Coke is the same thing as heaven or heroin. <laughs> and heaven is a multi-level marketing system of glory. <laughs> Nazi Mormons believe French kissing is cause for excommunication. They routinely take church advice and improve on it. If no single dating until 16 is good, no single dating until the draft age is even better. Nazi Mormons pay tithing based on their gross income plus the stuff they get from the bishop's storehouse. Five kinds of Mormons. What kind of reaction did you get to this? Your editor uh, didn't like it. Well, but. he did, but he ran it anyway. And uh, I was sitting in the newsroom the next day reading it when the doors of the newsroom burst open and in came the publisher of the paper at that time. <clears throat> and uh, he went over to the editor and yelled at him about running this sort of thing in Utah County, uh, which everybody kind of knows is the Tehran of Utah. <laughs> And he predicted we were going to get really angry letters to the editor, and <clears throat> he was right, because he went back up to his office and he wrote the first one. <laughs> and this is the only time this has ever happened to me, where uh, the next day there was a, a letter to the paper's editor from the paper's publisher <laughs> telling all the paper's readers what an idiot one of the paper's writers was. <laughs> and that was... Pretty bad, but uh, something else even worse happened, and that was that it was the only bad letter we got. All the rest of the mail about five kinds of Mormons, and it was a lot, uh, basically told the publisher that they liked this kind of humor about the culture that they were either a part of or trapped in, <laughs> and wanted to see more of it. And. Two things occurred to me when, I, when that happened, because I hadn't poked fun at Mormons before that, but the two things that occurred to me were that this, there might be a market for this sort of thing in Utah. <laughs> Who knew? And the second thing that occurred to me was that I needed a new job, <laughs> because when I wouldn't stop doing it, they fired me. <laughs> but the, I mean, humor is very subjective, and there is a fine line between uh, between the sacred and the profane. Okay. Divine intervention. Um, is there is there anything you will not write about? Oh yeah. Um, I believe that you can find humor in just about everything. The real question is, is what you can sell to other people or what you can use to other people. Um, <clears throat> if you stop and think about it, sex is pretty funny. Um, and there are a lot of jokes about it that are maybe a little bit off color, but you can tell them and get away with them. There's nothing at all funny about the sexual abuse of children. So within the context of human sexuality, there are limits to where you can go with humor. And the same thing is true of people's faith I don't make fun of church ordinances of any church. I don't make fun of um, what people would consider sacred. There are a lot of jokes that you could make about what goes on in the temple. I don't make those. I don't make fun of Catholic mass or anything like that. Um, because that's really the business of what goes on inside the church uh, in a reverent setting. But, when you come outside the church and you practice that stuff you learned on other people, then you're in my yard. Have you ever gotten in trouble from church leaders about something that you've written? You are an active member of the yeah. LDS church. I work in the nursery in my ward. In fact... We heard about that. Yeah, the bishop is here somewhere. There he is, over there. Um, yeah, I go to church every Sunday. Well, 
Um, no, actually, well, yeah, 95%. <clears throat> um, but what Terry was talking about, saying that I could beat President Hinckley up, yeah, that, that got me in a little bit of trouble. I got a, <clears throat> I was ecumenal about it. I, people had been asking me if I was afraid of church leaders. And I got tired of that because um, it just seemed to be a moot point. Other LDS writers had been getting disciplined by the church for challenging the church's theology. But I was really more interested in human behavior. I don't care what you believe, I care how you believe it. Now, that's where a humorist is, you know, that's where they, we best operate. I got tired of answering that question, you know, aren't you afraid of church leaders? So I wrote the column and I said, I'm not afraid of church leaders because they're old. <laughs> and I said, all things being equal, I was pretty sure I could beat President Hinckley up. <laughs> and I was ecumenal, also said I could beat up the Pope. <laughs>